If Greenland broke up and melted, or if half of Greenland and half of West Antarctica broke up and melted, this is what would happen to the sea level in Florida. Well, yes, but it's rather like saying that if the Rockefeller Center turned into a banana split, ice cream would melt all over Fifth Avenue. The crucial question is, how likely is that to happen? I covered the science of climate change earlier in this series. This video will continue our look at climate change urban myths. So let's look more closely at Al Gore's claim about a 20-foot rise in sea levels. The important word here, of course, is if. Gore isn't exactly lying. If these ice sheets melted, then yes, we could get a 20-foot rise in sea levels, although more recent research suggests the figure would be less. But no climate scientist is saying it'll happen any time soon. At current warming rates, the data show it'll take at least a thousand years for the Greenland ice sheet to completely melt, and thousands more for the West Antarctic ice sheet to melt. So what do the experts say? Climate scientists agree that sea levels have been rising by about 1.8 millimeters a year for the past half century. But that rate of increase has accelerated since 1993 to around 3 millimeters a year. Recent research shows that melting ice is not the main contributor. More than half the rise is due to a principle of physics called thermal expansion. The world's oceans have been absorbing around 80% of global warming over the past few decades, and as they warm up, they expand. New evidence suggests that glacial melt will become an increasingly important factor. At the Climate Change Congress in March 2009, evidence was presented by a number of researchers suggesting that the rise by the end of this century will be at least a metre. That's not without consequences, of course, but it's a long way short of the six metres, the 20 feet, described by Al Gore. I've already looked at another urban myth spawned by an inconvenient truth in the first video, the muddying of the relationship between carbon dioxide concentrations and temperatures during interglacials. The answer to Gore's clever wordplay should have been a documentary that corrected the errors and more accurately reflected the conclusions of climate scientists based on research and evidence. Instead, we got this. The Great Global Warming Swindle was written, directed and narrated by Martin Durkin, who has a degree in geophysics. Sorry, not geophysics. He has a degree in ancient and medieval history and a career as a financial journalist. And yes, Durkin shows very convincingly that man-made gases are not responsible for climate change. So Professor Fries Christiansen and his colleagues examined 400 years of astronomical records to compare sunspot activity against temperature variation. Durkin attributes this graph to Henrik Svensmark and Egil Fries Christiansen, whose work I looked at in the second video. But in fact, it's not their graph. Durkin had this graph drawn up himself, and he's accused of fabricating the data on which it was based. The person who accused him of fabricating wasn't Al Gore or even a proponent of anthropogenic climate change. It was the man whose graph Durkin is claiming to reproduce, Egil Fries Christensen himself. In a joint statement after watching the program, Fries Christensen wrote, we have reason to believe that parts of the graph were made up of fabricated data that were presented as genuine. And he criticized Durkin for attributing this conclusion to his research. It was the sun, it seemed, not carbon dioxide or anything else, that was driving changes in the climate. Fritz Christensen called this an overstatement that is not supported by the graph, interview statements by Fritz Christensen in the program, nor any related scientific literature. Now, Fritz Christensen was interviewed by Durkin and appeared in the program. He's a well-known skeptic who doesn't think that man-made gases are largely responsible for climate change. So when he complains that Durkin is fraudulently distorting the case for anthropogenic climate change, even die-hard fans of the great global warming swindle have to listen. This wasn't the only graph Durkin tampered with. Here's another. Most of the rise in temperature occurred before 1940 during a period when industrial production was relatively insignificant. And the graph, made by NASA, clearly supports Durkin's assertion. As you can see, most of the warming we've experienced over the last 120 years did indeed occur before 1940, when much less industrial carbon dioxide was being pumped into the air. So why do climate scientists insist that most of the warming has occurred since 1975? Because the graph is a complete fabrication. 
NASA never produced it. Durkin did. And since Durkin wanted us to believe that most warming took place before 1940, that's exactly what he had drawn. Here's NASA's actual graph of average global temperatures for the same period, as it shows Durkin's assertion that most of the rise in temperature occurred before 1940 is fallacious. Let's superimpose one graph over the other. If Durkin really did use NASA's graph as his source, then we can see how radically he's altered it. Durkin turns the variations in temperature before 1920 into an almost uninterrupted warming trend, and he drastically increases the warming trend prior to 1940. Fris Christensen was right to cry fraud, and he wasn't the only interviewee to do so. Carl Wunsch is Professor of Oceanography at MIT. After the great global warming swindle was broadcast, Wunsch wrote a furious letter to WAG TV. I'm sure in explaining that a warming ocean could expel more carbon dioxide than it absorbs, he wrote, thus exacerbating the greenhouse gas buildup in the atmosphere, and hence worrisome. It was used in the film through its context to imply that CO2 is all natural, coming from the ocean, and that therefore the human element is irrelevant. This use of my remarks, which are literally what I said, comes close to fraud. So now let's wade through all the fabricated graphs and the emotional appeals and the fallacies and the exaggerations in both movies and let's find out what the research shows. Why do we suppose that carbon dioxide is responsible for our changing climate? CO2 forms only a very small part of the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, we measure changes in the level of atmospheric CO2 in tens of parts per million. To answer that question, Durkin could have read some of the hundreds of scientific papers based on research that shows exactly why. Or he could have asked a climatologist who could have told him. Or Durkin could have picked up a science book from the local library. Or he could have drunk water laced with a teeny tiny amount of strychnine to see what effect one tiny substance has on his body. Tiny amounts of things can have big effects. There's far less ozone in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide and yet it protects the Earth from ultraviolet radiation. So the fact that carbon dioxide makes up a very small part of our atmosphere is immaterial. The reason it's important to climate change is that it absorbs solar radiation that other greenhouse gases, such as water vapor, let through. This was explained in the second video of this series. So if you want to know how it works, take a look. A couple of years ago in Europe, they had that massive heat wave that killed 35,000 people. India didn't get as... Let me explain how climatologists derive their temperature data. They look out of the window, and if it's unusually hot, they conclude that the Earth must be heating up. If it's unusually cold, they conclude the Earth must be cooling down. If that sounds stupid, you're right. But that's exactly how a lot of amateurs evaluate the evidence. A heat wave in Europe in a single year could be due to a number of factors that have nothing to do with climate change. Amateur skeptics do exactly the same thing. When it snowed in Malibu and Las Vegas, amateurs leapt to the conclusion that the Earth must be cooling. So what do the experts say? Well, to properly assess the global climate, they don't just take readings in Malibu, Las Vegas and Paris. They monitor temperatures all over the world and take an average. It may have been snowing in Malibu in December 2008, but on the other side of the world, Moscow was getting very little snow and recording record high winter temperatures. You can't look out of your window in Malibu and conclude that the world's cooling any more than you can look out of your window in Moscow and conclude that it's warming. Climatologists also do something called smoothing. Weather cycles and solar cycles affect the Earth's temperature year by year, so temperature data are averaged out over periods of five years or so. After all, Europe might face a heat wave one year but it could be cooling the next. I have to apologize for the fact that what was supposed to be a couple of videos looking at the science of climate change has turned into a rather long series debunking all the mythological crap that's been built up around it. But every time I turn over a rock, it seems like a new piece of junk science crawls out from underneath it. An Inconvenient Truth and the Great Global Warming Swindle are both icons in the public debate, the amateur debate, about climate change and both are flawed. I'll refer back to them over the next couple of videos as I look at more of the urban myths they've spawned.